Sunday, we had Jed Methane here, who was talking about the condition of Tennessee. And uh, Tennessee is in a very, very unique position to be an example for not only the rest of the United States, but the rest of the world. One of the things he mentioned, I believe, I don't know if he mentioned this on the video or if this was in a private conversation with us, but the majority of the funding coming to all the world for the terrorism that's going to take place in America comes from Tennessee. You never know that, but it does. Whoa. Yeah. Because we have such a malar large majority, and they're watching. They're checking the bank accounts. They're watching. Don't think they're not watching. They're paying close attention. Because again, they have a plan, just like God has a plan. Now, their plan doesn't match God's plan. It can't. A, because they don't know God's plan. But out of the 99 representatives that exist, they're God-fearing men, a large majority of them. And as long as that's the case, the pivot... <clears throat> See, even when back in, 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 in the time of Noah, it was all centered around a pivot between believers and unbelievers. It's a, a balanced scale. And when that scale became so great that there were more unbelievers than believers, God said enough. And he took care of it. Sodom and Gomorrah, the same thing. Greece, same thing. America, Right now, we're probably about maybe right there. We're not here yet. Why? Because the church is like Sparta Bible Church. And because of the other Bible churches in the country. See, it's not a coincidence that we're called Sparta Bible Church. You probably just think one day that name just popped up, and it did. But there's, there's a meaning behind it. It says a lot. It speaks, yet doesn't say a word. A Bible church is different than a Baptist church. It's different than any other kind of church because its <coughs> emphasis is on the Bible. And what we're going to find tonight, I don't know if, you, if you've noticed, but over the last about six, five or six weeks, I've been introducing you to new books, little books, that have been in the Bible first. And then we transition over. And I didn't understand why he was doing that. I even mentioned last Sunday night that this seems to be the pattern. It's because these little books, although they're little, they're mighty in content. And they all tie in to the message that he's given us. See, just because we have three separate sermon topics, the Holy <laughs> Grace gifts, Proverbs, wisdom from living, wisdom for living, and Genesis, the beginnings. There's something, there's a common denominator. Besides God, besides the Bible, it's within the message. Have you noticed how on any service, it intertwines with one another. It's because we're a church. And see, I can have, we can have five services named all different things. But to God, it's the same service. It's the same. It's a continuation. It, it opens up. It tells a story. When you, 20 years from now, when we look back and we see the, I don't know, however many hundreds of videos that we have. And we begin to see what God delivered. See, God delivered a message here. He continues to deliver his message. It hasn't stopped. It's continuing on from generation to generation through us. And although we here watch and learn now, it's after the fact that people continue to come back and they continue to get the teachings. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people, at the end of this year, I'm, I'm going to share the stats again with where we were, and I'm going to compare them to the past. And what you're going to find 
is that God's church is definitely not just Sparta. It's called Sparta Bible Church because it tells the rest of the world that Sparta is a church. Now, our history tells us a lot about Sparta, doesn't it? You see the movie 300? You see the movie 300? You've seen it, right? What made Sparta such a powerful army? There, wasn't a, there was only 300 of them. There wasn't a lot of them. Compared to the armies of a million over in Persia and in the other countries, there was just 300 men, a remnant. Sparta has always been centered around a remnant. See, to God, Sparta was called something else before Sparta. If you go back to the history of Sparta, you will find more history. And to us, although this is our generation and this is where we're at, maybe Sparta will remain Sparta for another 50 years or however long we're here. Or it can end and that's it. There is no more Sparta. Or they can change the name. But the fact is the message that he's delivering here is unique and special to Sparta, but yet reaches those out who are also watching because his word never returns void. I share with this little introduction because as we go into Nahum, which is maybe a book you've never read before, it's, it, it's not a very, for example, did you happen to notice that Sunday's overtone, it wasn't one of those sweet feel-good messages. It was one of those, oh, wake up call, hello. That was the kind of message it was. It wasn't a very, you know, peaceful, sweet, ear-tickling good message. It was, it was deep in it content. Huh. Yeah. But that truth put a new fire in me, seeing why God has a purpose and a plan for this church. Let's go to Nahum. Or as Carol called it, Nahum. <laughs> Nahum. Maybe that's right. It's kind of like the town Beersheba. I thought it was Beersheba. Oh, really? It's Louisville. Louisville? Louisville. I thought it was Beersheba. <laughs> or Beersheba. I guess Beersheba used to be booming. The booming town of Beersheba. <laughs> Nahum, too, also used to be a pretty booming town, too. You'll find Nahum, it's after Micah, before Habakkuk, right before the New Testament. And Nahum. It was actually a person from Elkosh, probably in Judah. His name means consolation or full of comfort. Nahum, full of comfort. Didn't we talk about comfort today? Comfort comes in the hope, in the confidence of knowing our future. It's mentioned nowhere else in Scripture with the possible exception of Luke 3.25. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah. Habakkuk and Zephaniah. We know nothing of the prophet other than this. Two bits of historical information within the book itself help <laughs> fix the date, which is referring to the capture of Thebes, which fell on the Assyrians in 661 BC, 661 years before Christ. Throughout the book and fall of Nineveh is still in the future. Now, we heard about Nineveh, didn't we? From where? What book? John. John. That's right. See how it's all tied in? God, I swear, the Lord said to me, go to Nahum. I said, Nahum? I forgot that that was even a book. I never read it. It's cool how it relates to what I'm doing in the nursery. <laughs> uh-huh. That would be a God thing, sovereignty, chapter 1, verses 1. He's got the monopoly out there. It was subsequently taken in 612 B.C. And it says to consider these two events that most scholars place the date about 620. 
Judah was crying out. Has God forsaken Judah? There are many people who wonder if, why, if God has forsaken America, but they forget why we're in the condition we are. Has God forsaken Judah? Why did the Assyrians so full of evil prosper? Allow me this opportunity to change these words. This is an introduction, not the Bible, so I can do that. Why has God forsaken America and has blessed the East with so much finances that they can do all they can do? He can take their money and then they wouldn't be able to do anything. But obviously he's blessed them. Why? Because he's faithful. He's faithful to Ishmael. Just because he's faithful to Israel, he's also faithful to other countries. Because he's God. He's justice. We learned that. He's fair. He's fair in all cases. We've even read in Proverbs. Why do the prosper continue to be blessed? Get rid of them and we'll live happily ever after and sing Kumbaya. Because that's not his plan. His plan isn't for us to be prosperous and to be happy all the time. It's not. I'm sorry. It's bad news. He wants us to suffer. Why? Because that's how we learn. That's how we grow. You have to have that. You have to have persecution. Those that say, oh, oh, having Jesus, you're, you're rich and, and, and you've got everything you've ever wanted and, and you're never miserable. And you, that's a lot of hockey puck. Hockey puck, poppycock, balderdash. <laughs> Malarkey, all kinds of words. BR. Are God's promises empty? He asks. The powerful military state of Assyria, with its great wealth, continually oppressed Judah, almost enslaving her. National life was very precarious, spiritual life was diminishing, and the nation was continually endangered by marauding bands from Nineveh. Huh. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? She was desperately needing answers to these questions when Nahum thundered on the scene proclaiming, Nineveh will fall. Could you imagine if I preached, America's going to fall! How popular I'd be? Not very popular. Even Billy Graham, who before he had a ministry, he was in seminary for four years with another gentleman. This other gentleman knew a friend of mine. And I heard a story recently about how when Billy Graham started, he was going to be a pastor. And his friend was going to be an evangelist. And at the end of four years, what happened? He flipped. And Billy Graham, knowing the gospel, knowing churches, knowing ministry, had to make a decision. He knew that if he taught salvation by grace alone, there wouldn't be many people. But if he taught, well, you got to do some work, then he could get the crowds in. But what people didn't know is that the audience, you know, whenever he would be up there and do his thing and do it very well, then he would invite people up and they would all pour in from the seats. Well, they didn't talk to Billy, did they? No. No. They had local churches who were there to help take care of that. And even though he knew that he believed that salvation was by grace, he said it many times, he had to do the invitation he did because it drew people in. Now, personally, I can't work that way. That's not my call. My call is to deliver the truth to whoever will listen. I'm not going to have to play or do something differently to attract people. If my personality won't do it, nothing will. People know me now. It's not a quiet town. <laughs> My own daughter was driving down the street last Sunday night. She said, Daddy, what were you doing? I said, what do you mean? She said, we drove by and you were, were doing something. <laughs> yeah. They don't know. They don't know. People don't know. But God knows. And he has a purpose and a reason for everything. 
And watch this. Listen to what he says. God will save his people. In light of the Assyria's great might, the message seemed incredible. Jonah, a century and a half earlier, had denounced Nineveh if it did not repent. The time of repentance was the past. The voice of Nahum is, sh is harsh and vengeful. Nineveh will pay for ignoring God and oppressing the weak. The message is timeless. Those who arrogantly ignore and resist God will taste his wrath. But those who trust him will be saved by his love. That's what the introduction of Nahum says. Starting in verse 1. The oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkshite. A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved, and by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good. <laughs> I like how he just throws that in to put a little softness right there. A stronghold in the day of trouble. See, he's the one when all heck breaks loose. When all shield him. begins to fall apart, we, all go him. we have the ability to rest in him. Just like they, because of the distress, will come to us and say, what do we not know? And we'll say, let, let me tell you about what we have. And he knows those who take refuge in him. So if disaster comes, does he not know that we're here? He knows we're here. He's got his eye on us at all times. Today, as I was leaving, I was like, uh oh. Oh, 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 oh. I said, wait a second. We've got an alarm. We've got God. It's his to begin with. If he wants it back, he can have it. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight. And will persecute his enemies in the darkness. Whatever you desire against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. Like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble completely withered. From you, from you has gone forth one who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so, they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break his yoke bar from upon you, and I will tear off your shackles. You see? I know it's not easy right now. He said, but when, when it gets real bad for everyone else, our shackles are coming off. We'll have peace in the midst of the storm, praise God. The Lord has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. Amen. I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are not contemptible. Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news. Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news. Behold, on the mountain the feet of him who brings good news. It sounds like they're talking about Jesus, aren't they? The good news. But guess what? At this time, just like in Nineveh, there was a pastor giving good news. I give you good news. I stand on top of the mountain and tell you, trust in him. You'll make it. Who announces peace. Celebrate your feast, O Judah. Pay your vows and never again will... The wicked one passed through you. He is cut off completely. The one who scatters has come up against you. Man the fortress, watch the road. Strengthen your back. Summon all your strength. For the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob. Like the splendor of Israel. Even though devastators have devastated them. And destroyed. 
destroyed their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The warriors are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel. When he is prepared to march, and the cypress spears are brandished, you see, they were prepared. We too are prepared. Even our little friend over there. The chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro like lightning flashes. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their march. They hurry to, to her wall, and, and the mantle is set up. The gates of the rivers are opened, and the palace dissolved, and it is fixed. She is stripped. She is carried away, and her handmaids are moaning like the sound of the doves, beating on their breasts. Though Nineveh was like a pool of water through her days, now they are fleeing. Stop! Stop! But no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold, for there is no limit to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. She is empty. Yes, she is desolate and waste. Hearts are melting and knees knocking. Also, anguish is in the whole body, and all their faces are grown pale. Where is the den of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, lioness, and lions cub proud, when nothing to disturb them. The lion tore enough for his cubs. Killed enough for his lionesses, and filled his lairs with, with prey, and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I'm against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn up her chariots in smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. That's why we have YouTube. If anything ever happens to me. It will continue. Because <clears throat> the enemy doesn't like me. But God likes me better. <laughs> Thank goodness. <clears throat> Woe to the bloody city, completely full of lies and pillage. Her prey never departs. The noise of the whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheel, galloping horses and bouncing chariots. Boy, if, if, if we were to describe this today, although... We don't have whips and we don't have rattlings of wheel or galloping horses. He'd probably be saying, and the beating music. <laughs> Horsemen charging, swords flashing, spears gleaming. Many slain a mass of corpses and countless dead bodies. They stumble over the dead bodies. We have no idea. We have no idea what disaster is in this country. No clue. But we will. All because of the many harlots of harlotries of the harlot, the charming one, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations by her harlotries and families by her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face. Hello. I will lift up your skirts up over <laughs> your face. That means I will reveal you in your splendor, saying that people will know who you are and what you're all about. And show to the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your disgrace. I will throw filth on you and make you vile and set you up as a spectacle. And I will come about now and set you up as a spectacle. And set you up as a spectacle. You ever heard that before, Pam? Set you up as a spectacle. Remember the spectacle or spectacles? He's setting them up. And the angels are gonna, the angels are, they watched all this. They were witnesses to this. Keep in mind, this is back, behind. But doesn't it sound like we're talking about the future? It does. Sounds like what's going on over there now. Oh. And I will come about that all who see you will shrink from you and say, Nineveh is devastated. Who will grieve her? Where will I seek comforters for you? Are you better than Noamon, which was situated by the waters of the Niles with water surrounding her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall consisted of the sea? Ethiopia was her might, and Egypt too, without limits. Put the Lubin were, put the Lubin were among her helpers. Put and Lubin, those are names. Yeah. <laughs> I've got Lubin. You got Libya? 
Praise God. Were among her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Although also her small children were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her horrible men. And all her great men were bound, bound, bound with feather, fetters. You too will become drunk. You will be hidden. You will search for a refuge from the enemy. All your fornications are fig trees with ripe fruit. When shaken, they fall into the eater's mouth. Behold, your people are women in your midst. The gates of your land are open wide to your enemies. Fire consumes your gate bars. Draw for yourself water for the siege. Strengthen your fornications. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Take hold of the brick mold. Their fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. It will consume you as the locust does. Multiply yourself like the creeping locust. Multiply yourself like the swarming <laughs> locust. He's telling them, you just keep on doing what you're doing. You, you go ahead. You keep on and, and just keep on. I'm still God. You have increased your traitors more than the stars of heaven. The creeping locust strips and flies away. Your guardsmen are like the swarming locust. Your marshals are like hordes of grasshoppers settling on the stone walls on a cold day. The sun rises and they flee, and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds are sleeping, O king of Assyria. Your nobles are lying down. Your people are scattered on the mountains, and there is no one to regather them. There is no relief for your breakdown. Your wound is incurable. All who hear about you will clap their hands over you. For on whom has not your evil passed continually? Turn to Proverbs 21. Then we're going to go to Revelation 21. Then we're going to go to Job 21. But right now we're going to go to Proverbs 21. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Every man's way is right in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the hearts. To do righteousness and justice is desired by the Lord rather than sacrifice. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked is sin. The lamp of the wicked is sin. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor, the pursuit of death. The violence of the wicked will drag them away because they refuse to act with justice. The way of a guilty man is crooked, but as for the pure, his conduct is upright. It is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. i got to stop right there for one moment. <laughs> have you noticed? What about Proverbs have you noticed? Tell me you've noticed that in every book of Proverbs, he compares to a woman that is irritating the you-know-what out of him. <coughs> who, wrote, who wrote Proverbs? But notice, in Proverbs, we've been reading, there's always a contrast, always a contrast between peace and a contentious woman. It's not a coincidence, I assure you. When we get to the end of Proverbs, you'll know why. You will know why. Wait till we get to Revelation 21, you'll know sooner than that. But we're not going there yet. city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh-oh. A bride adorned 
for her husband. Here's she again. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write for these words. Write for these words are faithful. And hey, Billy, you know right is biblical. Mm -hmm. And he said, You know right for these words are faithful and true. Look at that. He said, Right? Right. Wow. How do you like that? And you thought you were the creator. Isn't that funny? <laughs> And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Hello. Without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. He who, Hello. Uh -huh. he who perseveres, he who doesn't let the distractions of the world make him lose sight of God's plan. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, and everyone that we read in Nahum and Nineveh, and all, all everything that we've been covering, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I shall show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Contentious woman. See how he uses the female gender? We haven't even got to Genesis yet. We're just getting into the good spot to explain it. God has a plan. For her, he does. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written to them, which are those of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Then were three gates on the east, and three gates of the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates of the west. Is your mind imagining that there's a lot of gates? Look at how he draws pictures with words. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. What state is 1,500 miles away? Any idea? Chicago 6. Huh? It's about the size of Texas. It's about the size of Texas. 1,500 miles. I wonder where the buffet is going to be. <laughs> and its length and width are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. 72 yards. How many yards is a football field? 100? 300. 300 yards? 100 yards, how many feet? 300. 300. It's a pretty tall wall. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Have you ever seen clear gold? The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third sheldoni, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth pearl, the ninth topaz, the tenth carnal phrase, the, the eleventh jessin, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. 
And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Ooh. So much for the building being the church. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no light, there its gates shall never be closed, and they shall bring the glory of the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Turn to Job 21. starts this off. Like it's even, have you ever heard the people say, well, let me be honest with you. Well, what, have you lied to me the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> they, you, they, people say that because they want you to pay attention to what, because what they're about to say is so true, more true than anything else that they've ever said. But if you're always truthful, you never have to say, well, let me be honest with you. You just say it. Look at what Job says. What? 21. 21. Job 21. Listen carefully to my speech. Well, if you're talking, obviously, we have to listen to your speech. <laughs> but he's saying, pay attention. Bear with me that I may speak. In other words, stop talking, be patient, and listen. That's why God gives us two ears and one mouth. We listen twice as much as we speak. <laughs> Trust me, I have the hardest time with that. <laughs> then after I have spoken, you may mock. As for me, is my compliant to man. And why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished. This is Job 20. Look at all he's been through. Have you read Job? Yeah. Look at what he's been through. How he's saying, look at me. Look at what I've been through. And put your hand over your mouth. Meaning, lift up your mouth, because they're like this. Even when I remember, I am disturbed, and horror takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked still live? Continue on, also become very powerful. Their descendants are established with them in their sight, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God on them. His ox mates without fail. His cow calves and does not abort. They send forth their little ones like the flock, and their children skip about. They sing to the tremble and harp and rejoice at the sound of the flute. They spend their days in prosperity, and suddenly they go down to Sheol. And they say to God, Depart from us. We do not even desire the knowledge of thy ways. Hello. Outrightly. We don't need God. We've got our own God. We have our own God. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what would we gain if we entreat Him? Behold, their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out, or does their calamity fall on them? Does God apportion destruction in His anger? Let me tell you about my God. I'm quoting. Let me tell you about my God. He wants you dead. If that's the God you want me to serve, I'm not quoting anymore. I'm answering. You want me to serve a God that wants someone dead? No, thank you. You can have that God. My God is a God of love. Yes, he's a God of justice. But their argument is that those that are unfaithful, God will get rid of. See how they took God's justice 
And now they use that justice as a weapon, as justification. Mm. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? 17. Or does their calamity fall on them? Does God apportion destruction in his anger? Are they as straw before the wind, like chaff which the storm carries away? See, the same thing I just said. You say God stores away a man's iniquity for his sons. Let God repay him so that he may know it. See the difference? God, to us, he's the judge. He'll take care of the destruction. We don't have to. Our job is just to love one another. That's the difference. If you come to me and tell me you want me to serve God and go love everyone in the neighborhood, I think I can do that. But if you want to tell me that God wants me to go and if they don't believe, kill them, that's God's job, not mine. Let his own eyes see his decay. Let him drink the wrath of the Almighty. See? Do you see, Pam, why God told me to go to Job 21? He wanted me to battle this out last Sunday. Because I don't know about you, but it's been on my mind a lot. I don't fear it. I'm not afraid of it. But it definitely woke me up. I didn't realize how close it was. I figured, you know, we were maybe five or ten years out. We're now. Now is the time. In Dearborn, Michigan, it was yesterday, not today. Today's changed for them. Two years ago, it changed for them. It's a slow transition. It's not an overnight all of a sudden you wake up and everything has changed. It, it, it's slow. It creeps in. You don't realize it, but it creeps in. For what does he care for his household after him? When the number of his months is cut off, can anyone teach God knowledge in that he judges those on high? One dies in his full strength, being holy at ease and satisfied. His sides are filled out with fat and the marrow of his bones is moist. While another dies with a bitter soul, never even tasting anything good. Oh, while another dies with a bitter soul, never even tasting anything good. There is such anger in this enemy. Bitterness. I was laying in bed early, early this morning before I got up to study. And he said, when they come to you, this is what you tell. Was dead silent. I didn't say, oh, I'm waiting. Okay, you're about to tell me something. Good. He said, if you choose to serve God with bitterness and anger and hatred, you have that right. You can take me right now. You have that option. You've been given the freedom to do whatever you want to me. But just know that after you finish your work, you'll still be here. And I'm gone. Let me tell you about God. Not my God. God. He's a God of love. Love. should be my last words. Should be. I don't know that for a fact. But that's what I heard. God is love three times. When I moved to Tennessee, he told me, just tell him I love him. Let him know I love him. I said, fine. So everyone I've met, I've told them, including <laughs> them. I'm referring them to whatever future enemy that awaits in front of me. Because God will stop them so I can say that. He's that faithful. Thank goodness. 
23. One dies in his full strength, being wholly at ease and satisfied. His sides are filled out with fat, and the marrow of his bones is moist. While yet another dies with a bitter soul, never even tasting anything good. Together they lie down in the dust, and worms cover them. Behold, I know your thoughts and the plans by which you would wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the nobleman? And where is the tent, the dwelling place of the wicked? Have you not asked wayfaring men? And do you not recognize their witness? For the wicked is reserved for the day of calamity. They will be led forth at the day of fury. Who will confront him with his actions? Who will repay him for what he has done? While he, he is carried to the grave, men will keep watch over his tomb. The clods of the valley will gently cover him. Moreover, all men will follow after him while countless ones go before him. How then will you vainly comfort me? For your answers remain full of falsehood. <laughs> we know our God. We know him. We love him. They say that his resurrection never happen. They say that he is not God. He's just a man. They say that they know what God has planned for them. But I can tell you it's a little G, not a big G. Because our big G has plans to prosper, plans with a future, plans with hope. You too will be presented with an alternative gospel. And you have a choice just like they did. If you haven't watched the movie, Losing Our Sons, that we got from I've, I've watched it already. I'm going to bring my copy back so that you can watch it. Did you see it yet? You watched it. I also put an excerpt on... You, you have one? Yeah. I also put an excerpt. You, you probably received a request or a suggestion to a new Facebook page this week called Americans for Christianity. By now we should have hit 100 likes okay, in less than a week. There's a reason. It's going to be a resource. I spoke to Judd yesterday. Told him about it. He said, thank you for doing that. Most people who I speak to, I tell them and they go, okay, thank you, and that's it. But he knows we're on fire for the truth. God is going to use this place. He will. He already has. A remnant. I had a conversation on, oh, you're probably wondering what happened yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. What happened was God had different plans. Uganda ran out of internet. And all the pastors got together and went into town, that's what he told me, to go raise funds for internet. Because they didn't have any. So India joined us. And Darlington joined us. And John Roberts joined us. And I, I, I'm glad I recorded it. Because John, and it's amazing. I have no time to edit. I've got all this audio from these last three, four weeks. Just haven't had time to edit it. It needs to be edited because... This program that we use for Skype, it puts one con one person to the right and the other person to the left. And when one person speaks, it cuts off what the other one says. So I just can't put the audio file out there because though it's it's very confusing. If if you're listening uh, in a stereo or in headphones or whatever it is, it's very confusing. So I've got a co I've got to copy the track and create another copy and pan the other side so it's uh -huh. equal. I just haven't had time. 
There's hours and hours and hours of excellent teaching. But John yesterday was incredible. From the passenger seat of a car with his cell phone and his laptop, and he's sitting there while his wife's in the store in Walmart shopping for Christmas, and he's getting nervous. He said, boy, oh, I gotta go, because I don't know what she's, how much she's spending, what she's doing. <laughs> but he was speaking to Canada, and to India, and to Pleasant Hill, with a very, very important message. And what God is doing, and Tuesday, we teach India, Liberia, we have two pastors for Liberia, who both are from opposite areas, but in the same city. It's like one's from Cookville, the other one's from Sparta. They met in the middle the other day. Oh. And now they're putting together a plan for Liberia. Because the first guy, Maxwell, who's the first one who started World War Bible Training with us, didn't have a laptop. But Sheely Dennis does. That's why they've come together. Two now are going into a city. They're going to gather pastors and bring them to a look with the laptop. To, well, I don't know where they're going with. I don't worry about what they're doing. That's God's business. All I know is we've got the teachers now. We've got more teachers, and even Maurice Mawale is going to be coming in soon. And he teaches from Kenya, but he's going to let us use his church where we're going to be able to bring pastors in Nairobi. There are a lot of pastors in Nairobi. He's been looking for the avenue to draw them in. Now he's got it. And he'll bring hundreds in in Nairobi. And we will encourage them with the word. And that's, it's a great that's position awesome. to be in. Huh? That's awesome. It's God. And it all started here. And this was the, this was the, the beginning. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it, if you count the number of people, and I don't know out of the, what started with 60, and went to 103. I don't know how many of them are the same or have come back, but I know just from the ones, and including India and all, we probably taught about 500 people just through Skype. Father God, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for all these wonderful truths that you give us. Thank you for this body that you have prepared for your glory. We look forward to our time together next Wednesday. Thank you for all that you've done this week. We look forward to a Thanksgiving with you. We have so many things to give thanks for, but right now tonight, we just want to give thanks for today. What a wonderful day that you've given us. Thank you for both services and for your faithfulness and for your love. Continue to strengthen us and guide us. Continue to shield us from the influence of evil. Father, I can never leave that out in my prayer because there's so many things that can distract us, but you keep us focused and you keep us drawn to your truth. And we will forever be thankful that your word never returns away. We love you so much, and we ask these things in Christ's name.